Hi, Chris Albertine here from downtown Largo, Florida in Pinellas County at our brick and mortar store where we buy, sell, we appraise, we do it all. At this point, a lot of people ask me about military items, you know, swords, daggers, patches, buttons, but let's talk about Japanese swords. Are Japanese swords worth anything? So again, you know, does everybody familiar with the Japanese swords, like the samurai swords back in the day where they'd walk around and if you, this, this theory was is if you looked them in the eyes, they would pop out their sword and cut your head off. I don't know if that's true or not, but it sounds pretty gruesome if it is. But these swords were very sharp and very capable of cutting your head off. That's how they were uh, magnificent things of beauty when they were made. They were folded thousands of times. They were, it was very much a ceremony when they made these. And they've been making them for th at least a thousand years that I know of. So many of the swords that we're talking about have come back from World War II. Your uncle, your grand, well not your uncle, I guess your great uncle at this point, and your grandfather came back and he had some swords and put them in his closet. Now you found them, what do you do with them? Well, Japanese swords that are handmade are very valuable and they all go on, eh, I would say very valuable. They used to be extremely valuable, but a typical Japanese sword, remember March 2019, for handmade, 500 to maybe 5,000. Uh, most of them being in the $500 to $1,000 range. But what would catapult my sword to being worth more? Well, number one, just as in with anything, this is a great video because it goes along with a lot of the different things in military items. Condition is always important. And also, is, is it in polish? I mean, when you look at this, these blades, are they immaculate or are they rusted or pitted? If they're rusted or pitted, they're not going to be worth very much at all. Then we're talking like $50 to $150. And if it's a you know, dagger, probably even less than that. In the Japanese culture, these swords are very important, but they're very important when they're intact. And what that means by intact is they have to have a temper line. And if everybody's been watching TV and watching how they do these knife makings uh, recently on um, the History Channel, great show. I can't mention it, but it's a great show. Um, they show you how, the, how you take it, you heat the metal up, you put clay on it, and you quench it. And then what you do is you create a hard part of the blade and a soft part of the blade. What that does is the hard part of the blade allows the blade to be polished extremely sharp and the soft part gives it some give. So like when you hit it real hard against something, it's not gonna break or shatter. If it was completely tempered, it would shatter on impact and that wouldn't be any good. So basically, the problem with having these is a lot of these Japanese swords have what they call kizu. That's a Japanese term for a crack that goes straight down. So when you're looking at a Japanese sword, if it's pitted, out of polish, no temper line, possibly has a kizu in it. You're talking about a blade that might be worth $50 to $150. However, there are a lot better swords than that. The maker is very important. Now again, just like any antique, if the sword's out of polish, ruined, could be the best maker in the world, it's not gonna be worth anything. It has to be functional as a sword. It has to be able to cut something without breaking. So with that being said, what are some of the additional things that make a sword better? Who signed it? Who made it, of course? And swords, I've actually had Japanese swords that are three, three four, five hundred years old. Yes, 500 year old swords that are still in existence today. It sounds mind boggling, but it's true. The length of the sword. Now, the Japanese were pretty much generally shorter people in general. Um, there are tall Japanese. I'm not saying there's not, but Japanese, um, what that meant is a lot of the Japanese swords or the majority are under 29 inches because they had to be a certain length to hit, hit the, uh, where they should hang for the person that was carrying it. So today, in today's market, especially for Westerners, the longer the sword, the better. If you have a 28 to 32 inch sword, that is something that may have some value. Also, these swords come what they call in mountings. Like they come with a scabbard, a suba, which is the sword guard. They have, they have the hilt, which is something on the hilt. They have a manuki, which is the decoration on, the, on it. And so what it is, is when your sword's all put together, it's a symbol of who you are, your family lineage. Sometimes they have family crests on them. All of these things add to making a sword much better. Sometimes you pull the sword out and it's got a design on the blade. Sometimes that's good. But also, other times, it meant that they were covering a flaw in the blade. Uh, also, in today's world, if you think you have something that's really rare, 
you have to get paperwork on it. You have to get it authenticated. You have to get it in polish. Unfortunately, that process can cost anywhere from $2,000 to $5,000. And again, if your sword's worth $5,000, do you want to spend $5,000 to get all these credentials? Doesn't seem like it'd really be worth it. So your best bet is if you do have any questions and you want to know something about your sword, send some pictures to us because there's man-made blades out there. There's some that were partially made. Uh, again, if you want to know the value of your sword, especially your Japanese swords, even if you want to know the history of it, I, I may not be able to tell you exactly everything, but I can definitely tell you a very good idea of who made it, where it's from, and an approximate value. Send me some emails, send me some pictures, let me know. Thanks for calling. I mean, watching. <laughs> Take care, guys.